Greetings and welcome to A Conversation With. I'm Brandon Webb. Our conversation today is with physics professor Wolfgang Rindler, who focuses on theoretical relativistic cosmology and general relativity. Dr. Rindler's tenure here in space research actually predates UT Dallas. Originally the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest and founded by TI founders Eric Johnson, Cecil Green, and Eugene McDermott, the organization became the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies in 1967. Two years later, in 1969, the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies joined the University of Texas system, becoming UT Dallas. Dr. Rindler was born in Vienna. He obtained both his undergraduate and master's degree at Liverpool University and earned his doctoral degree from Imperial College in London. And he became an American citizen at the age of 85 just recently. Isn't that right, Dr. Rindler? Correct. Thank you so much for being here. You're most welcome. You study theoretical relativistic cosmology here at UT Dallas. And for the average listener, and especially for me, what does that mean? In a way, cosmology is the study of the universe on the largest possible scale. And one part of studying cosmology is to try and figure out how the universe is actually moving. The universe is, uh, although for many thousands of years people thought it was a completely static uh, thing, uh, within the 20th century people realized that the universe was in fact expanding, moving, and then the question is, uh, dynamically, how can you understand the motion of the entire universe? Relativistic cosmology is, is the application of Einstein's general relativity theory to the motion of the entire universe, and uh, that's what's been occupying me part of the time uh, for the last uh, 50 years or so. What is it about teaching that appeals to you? I enjoy imparting knowledge to students, and I enjoy the, 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 the phenomenon of, of suddenly a student understanding something that he didn't understand before. To me, it's a very rewarding pastime, and it helps writing my textbooks also because I test out in class what works and what doesn't work and the things, that the explanations that work best eventually go into textbooks. So teaching is something that I really enjoy very much. Uh, I get a lot of uh, energy out of teaching. As a matter of fact, it's a funny thing. I usually teach at night and <clears throat> sometimes I <clears throat> call my wife b before I go and teach uh, for some <clears throat> unimportant reason and then when I come back from class, I call her again just to say that I'll be home in such and such a time. And she always says, my God, you sound different. You sounded tired before you talked. Now you sound energized. So it, it, does, it does some good things for me, now, and, and I love it. You came to Cornell in 1956 and then later to an early predecessor of UT Dallas, the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies. When did you come here? What attracted you to a few sparse buildings and a cotton field? And who recruited you? In 1963, I imagine, uh, Ivo Robinson, uh, who was by then already the head of the mathematical group at at, uh, at but became scarce eventually, uh, who was a friend of mine from earlier years. And he said, Wolfgang, how much do you earn at Cornell? And I said, at that point, that was in uh, 63, 62 perhaps, I said, well, I earn $8,000 a year. And he said, well, how would you like to make 16000 I said, very much. Uh, <laughs> that sounded like a very nice office. Well, he said, come and join us. We are just beginning a new group at... Uh, at the, I guess it was called the Graduate Center in those days. I, I think of it as SCAS. We were forming a new group, a uh, relativity group at, 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 at the Graduate Center, and we'll be connected with the relativity group at Austin. Uh, so that seemed an offer one couldn't possibly refuse. Uh, the people were nice. Ivo, was a, by, by, Ivo Robinson was already a very well-known relativist, and it was a pleasure to think to be able to work with him and his group. The salary was nice. The idea of a, of a kind of a Princeton in, in Dallas was nice. So in every way, it, it seemed a nice offer, and, 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 and uh, I very happily accepted it. That was a wonderful place, SCAS. Uh, it was uh, founded by the uh, uh, founders of uh, Texas Instruments, Cecil Green, 
uh, Eugene McDermott and Eric Johnson, and they'd pumped, uh, I, I seem to remember a figure of something like $5 million into it as, as, a, as just to prime the pump, as they said. And then the idea was that um, we would uh, get grants from the government and, and in a way become self-supporting, uh, which for a while worked very well, and we did get a lot of grants. But then the um, politics changed considerably, and towards the 1970s, sort of enthusiasm that Kennedy had uh, generated originally for science sort of fizzled out, and the uh, uh, government no longer was that keen to support pure science, and essentially our, our, our funds ran out, and we had to make some, well, in fact, we made a, a gift of ourselves to the University of Texas system, who took us over and, and used us as the nucleus of the of UTD, which was fine. Uh, in fact, I've been very happy at, at UTD also, but those seven years at, uh, at SCAS were really wonderful years. SCAS was a very, very special institution. I tell you one, one thing that I should perhaps tell you, uh, which was uh, my introduction to, my very introduction to, uh, to, to, to SCAS uh, in 1963. That was, of course, the year that Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. And I, I think many of us who, who, came, to, uh, who came to SCAS in, in 1963 lived through that shock. What happened was that uh, I arrived at, uh, in Dallas in September 1963, and uh, <clears throat> I think in November uh, there was Kennedy's visit to Dallas was planned, and Kennedy was aware of the Southwest Center, and in fact he was going to give a speech here in Dallas uh, about the future of science, but amongst other things, he was going to spend quite a lot of time within his speech on on our center, and <clears throat> so because because that was known in advance, the entire faculty of the uh, of we call it the center there was the center for graduate studies, the entire faculty of the center and their wives were invited to the um, to the. Um, uh, there was a huge building downtown, I forget what it was called, something Mart, uh, that held something like 2,000 people. Uh, and uh, a luncheon was arranged there, and there were hundreds of tables, and, and Kennedy was supposed to talk there at 12.30 and address that huge audience of notables from Dallas. But amongst all these notables, there was the entire faculty from, from the center and he was going to talk about the center. But so people were there at 12 o'clock, and then he became 12.30 when he should have been there, and he still wasn't there. And then there were some rumors in the hall that uh, things would be delayed, and then somebody came to the podium and, and said people should start eating. There would be a delay in Kennedy's appearance. Meanwhile, a waiter came to our table See, in those days, people didn't have cell phones, and so once you were sitting at, at lunch, you, you had no connection with the outside. But the waiters coming from the kitchen, they had heard the radio in the kitchen, and so the waiter, they were Mexican waiters. The waiter came to our table, and he said, Kennedy, bang, 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 Kennedy, bang, bang, bang. So, my God, we thought, what, what on earth had happened? So that was the first indication we had that something terrible had happened. But people sort of kept on eating, and there were rumors going through the hall. And then very finally, uh, somebody came to the podium and said, uh, not to worry, there had been an accident. There had been an accident, and, and, and we'll be told more details later, but please keep on eating. So it was ridiculous. People were eating there, and Kennedy was already dead, but we didn't know that. And then very finally, somebody came to the podium and, and, and told us that what, what had happened. But that was a terrible shock. People all over the place started crying because, uh, and I, I think... Um, I think uh, that place was not well, was not unique. I think people all over the country probably cried when um, Kennedy. And for us also, it, it it was a terrible shock because the enthusiasm for science in 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 those days somehow had radiated away from Kennedy. And and, and we realized already at that point that the loss of Kennedy would really be 
in the end, bad, bad for science. But I mean, at, at the moment, the human tragedy of it all just seemed over, overwhelming, and we thought, my God, what have we... In those days, Dallas was an incredibly reactionary place, and you know, people say, oh, well, of course it ha had to happen to, in Dallas. It turned out later that it could have happened anywhere. It was a crazy man who k killed Kennedy, and it could have done happened in any other city as well. And I must say, very few of us, in the end, although at the time it seemed, my God, what, have, what place have we come to where the, things like that happen? But it, in the end, I think most people agree that uh, it wasn't the fault of Dallas. It was just an accident that it happened in Dallas. And most of us, in the end, found Dallas a, a very nice place to live and a very good place to live. And it, it eventually became a, even even politically and, 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 and academically a, a more open place. So, But anyway, it, it, it was a very sad introduction, which happened about six weeks or eight weeks after most of us arrived at the center. And in the ensuing 46 or 47 years, as you've seen the student population grow to beyond 15,000 and, and include lower division undergraduates, freshmen and sophomore, all the way up through graduate students, um, what what are you struck by most as you as you walk through campus today, some nearly fifty years later? At first, uh, we had very few students, and it seemed to be quite eerie to walk on on campus. Uh, it didn't seem like a real university because we had so few students. We had no undergraduates to start with, and uh, it was like a ghost town to start with. And then gradually. From year to year, it, it became more like a real university. Nowadays, when you, when you go any time of day and you see all these students milling around, and it's a very nice development. And I like the feeling. I, I like to see happy <clears throat> groups of students all, all, all over the campus. It's, it's, it, it's very pleasant. What, what has happened is that also the caliber of our students has, has definitely increased. At first... I suppose it takes a brave student to come to a new university that has, which has no tradition and they, they don't know what a degree from that university will be worth. By now, I think our university has a good name and we get better and better students. We attract better and better students. And I think that's, that's certainly a development that I've noticed. Will you continue to teach? As long as they'll have me, yes. I, I enjoy teaching and I, I draw a lot of energy from my teaching and pleasure and inspiration in every way. So I'll teach as long as they'll have me teach. And as you say, I'll be happy to talk again in 10 years. Well, it truly has <laughs> been a pleasure, Dr. Rindler. Thank you for stopping by. Well, thank you. This has been a conversation with Dr. Wolfgang Rindler, brought to you by the University of Texas at Dallas and the Office of Communications. To find out more about the university or any of our special guests, visit us on the web at utdallas.edu. UT Dallas, creating the future since 1969. Until the next conversation with, I'm Brandon Webb. Be well. Be well.